Hello, insiders. Welcome to this new episode of the EU Bubble Insider. Today, our guest is Brett Kobe, Creative and Strategy Director at Bump. Brett, great to have you with us today. Hey, how's it going? So, for those who don't know, uh, what Brett does, Brett does creative campaigns, videos, experiences. But most, what's most interesting is uh, his LinkedIn profile, which uh, is a goldmine of uh, practical advice, of uh, videos from, from, from the workshops he gives. Uh, and uh, it, to me, it, is, it, is, uh, it seems that uh, you are on a mission to teach the EU bubble how to be creative. Is that, is that right, Brett? Yeah, I mean, I, it, whether it's my mission or something that, you know, really needs to be done, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that there's lots of creative people around the bubble already, but they don't always have the outlet and the support they need to, to be at their best. So looking at your, at your past experience uh, before, you joined, uh, uh, before you joined Bump, you've been um, working in the EU bubble with uh, various uh, public affairs advocacy uh, projects. Uh, you've been doing comms for associations. After such a journey, how do you, how do you discover creativity uh, in yourself? How do you become a creative director for, for an agency? Uh, well, the first thing that you should do is um, just find one you like and then give yourself the title of creative director. That's the best way to do it. Um, but the, the longer kind of journey, um, I have a degree just like most people in the EU bubble. I have a, um, a focus in politics and European studies. Um, so on paper, I, I think um, I look a lot like everyone else. Um, and I think my journey has been a little bit different. Um, just, you know, started very much policy focused, uh, working for governments. Um, and then found myself into the trade association world because I was a native English speaker. I came back from New York after being gone for Brussels for a while, while and I needed a job. So I said, hey, I'll go pretend to do communications. Um, and they need a native English speaker. And that kind of launched uh, the, uh, the communication side of my career, which has been the focus now. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, then from there, from association world to agency world, and that's where I think I really had the chance to uh, figure out you know, do stuff that I really wanted to do um, and to be really strategic, but really creative at the same time. And it was all OK. Uh, it was, you know, it was a great a supportive environment for that um, at a big agency where I worked at um, because it was also good business. Um, and I think once you can show how you're getting results um, from a business perspective or from, or from an advocacy perspective, then you get licensed to do more. Uh, and then from from that kind of bigger agency, had gotten in touch with a, a small agency, um, which is Bump. Um, and we did a few projects together, like putting uh, an escape room in the European Parliament for FPA, the Pharma Association. Um, so really getting um, maybe more traditional thinkers to think strategically and creatively was a big coup um, there at, at my old job. And then Bump seemed to be the place where I could do that almost every day. Um, and now I, I do do it every day. So very lucky to be at Bump and, and spreading the word on creativity in the bubble. So... My experience in the bubble is uh, some, somewhere around eight years, and I, I have to say that um, I have never seen that much creative campaigns uh, being done as in the recent, let's say, two, three years. Uh, what do you think has changed? Why, why are uh, more and more um, associations, think tanks, uh, and, and other players in, 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 in the EU bubble space um, ready to... Uh, do their campaigns in a more creative way using more of the available uh, digital formats? Uh... Yeah, so I think that if I look around, I don't really believe that everyone is very explicitly embracing creativity. Um, I think that that's, that's still a little bit of a step too far and we hope to get there. And that's one of the things that we really hope for is that when we use the word creative or creative strategy or the fact that you might have a job as a creative, that it, that's not a weird thing right? That we look at the best in Brussels guide and we see a top creative agencies category instead of a digital category, which we're listed in. Great. Um, because it's not necessarily one of those things. Um, so I think the shift that we've seen is more a shift towards people embracing what's come to be known as policy communications. Um, the idea that there is a huge strategic communications component to winning at policy, whatever that may be, right? So there's different skill sets involved to go from policy analysis um, to advocacy 
to communications, that there's a whole spectrum of, of things that you need to be able to do to actually close the deal. Um, and I think that people now appreciate that. So they are seeing opportunities in this world of policy communications. Uh, and that is very much where, where we like to play. Um, whether or not you know, they're ready to talk about being creative, some, some of our clients, well, all of our clients are, because we position very specifically to attract that type of client. But there are many others who would look at us and say, you know, not for me, not ready. You know, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a bridge too far. Um, and, and usually we don't try to convince them, but what we would normally say is that we're not trying to reinvent wheels here. What we're doing is not rocket science. Um, what we do, whether you call it, you know, advocacy, communications, creativity, these are all words for the same thing, right? What you're trying to do is to achieve an outcome uh, and you want to use every tool that you have available to you and you don't want to rule things out because they make you uncomfortable, right? So an uncomfortable tactic may be exactly the tactic you need to, to, to achieve the objective that you're after. So uh, let's explore uh, what creativity actually means. Um, where, where do you... Um implement creativity is it is it the selection of tools um is it uh the the, the strategic brainstorm before you even start the campaign um is it tactics how do you um how do you actually make it work with clients who are not uh used to that type of activities uh, and that type of uh processes yeah so um Anything that you do, no matter what you call it in Brussels, it all starts with strategy. So we are, despite having a, a website with lots of cool visual looking things, we are first and foremost a strategy consultancy, just like everybody else. So not very differentiated there, right? So I think you've got to get your strategic foundations um, clear, right? So who's your audience? What's your objective? You know all those things. I won't go through them. But you have to go through that exercise. And I think the creativity comes in when uh, and, and creativity is not about what does it look like, is it what tool, what social channel, that's all for later, right? Um, the creativity comes in into this, uh, you know, the, this mindset of not limiting yourself to something that is safe in order to achieve the outcome, right? So if you, need to, if you know you need to move audience A um, from here to here, you don't do that. You don't say, I'm only going to do that with the, with the limited tactics or means that I know how to, right? I'm open to, uh, to trying whatever may work here, right? So it's just, uh, you know, the first step of being creative is not shutting down things that you don't know about and recognizing what you do know and what you don't know, right? And then finding the people uh, that you need to, to explore those other things. And you're exploring them because you feel that they may be useful to the outcome you're trying to achieve. It doesn't mean that, uh, and this, the, the last thing we try to do is convince people that they need an, you know, cool looking stuff or cool stuff. Uh, we don't sell cool stuff as such, right? It's not a sellable product. It's useless. Right? Stuff that just looks cool is not helpful. So even though the things that we do may look cool, there's a whole strategy exercise that has gone on before that, which is very, to be honest, very old school, right? We go through the same different um, parameters that we have to go to, but we just don't shut down um, possibilities to achieve the outcome, right? So creativity in a nutshell is um, open-mindedness, um, and, and also, you know, the ability, once you've got that problem and you've got this very specific set of constraints, like you've got a time limit on it, you've got a specific audience that you need to move, um, you know, you've got certain internal dynamics that you need to work with. So those are all constraints that actually breed beautiful creativity. So the best creative ideas are the ones that will um, obviously achieve your objective, but will work within those constraints um, to, to make you, you know, elaborate beyond your first thought of how you could do it, right? And when you've moved beyond your first thought and you're operating within those constraints to figure out exactly how you should do it, that is just a beautiful moment of, of creativity uh, where you think, okay, I could have done it the easy way. I probably would have failed. I, I went a little bit outside my comfort zone and we succeeded. Uh, and then that's how you know that it's actually worth your time, the whole creative thing. You recently did a workshop uh, for, for, or maybe even one, more than one workshop, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, about personal branding. Um, I think this is uh, something that many 
of uh, EU bubble professionals, especially commerce professionals, but not only, um, are are thinking about right now. Should I become more active on LinkedIn? Should I start posting daily updates or even must I start daily videos on my LinkedIn? Um, what do you, from from the you know experience you so far for had with with people you coached you you work with, what is the biggest challenge for people uh, when who, who don't have that kind of experience, who are not natural born uh, influencers? So the the first thing that we say in a training like this um, is that this is not for everyone, and if you don't find it useful and it doesn't feel natural to you. You should absolutely not do it, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can absolutely achieve the same objectives without touching social media at all, touching LinkedIn at all, right? So there's no one way to do your job, and you will know best. So when we start those trainings, uh, actually long before we even agree to show up and train, uh, we say that what will not happen today is you know, that we convert you into believers. Um, we will not start the session with convince me because we won't, right? We're not there to convince. We're there for the people who have already decided to take a step. Um, and also just on the, on the naming of things. So personal branding, I think, is a, is a term that doesn't work so well in the EU bubble. Um, I think that people have an aversion to that uh, because it feels too soft, not strategic enough, feels too much about the individual. So it's very uh, okay in, in the marketing world. Um, but it's not so okay in Brussels, right? Uh, is that a is that a good is there a good reason for that? Not really. <laughs> but instead, we we tend to use the term uh, thought leadership um, or executive profiling, uh, and that's mostly because we have focused our our efforts on working with more a more senior leader who uh, who does need to show up as a senior leader in one way or the other, whether it's LinkedIn or on video. Um, there are many ways that you do executive profiling or thought leadership. Um, but there is a real need for that. So there's no kind of should I, shouldn't I type thing. Um, so I think in, in that sense, those people are looking to develop a, a profile that speaks to their added value, that um, really gets them known in their, in their micro community, which we talk about. Uh, and then they're, they're usually ready to go a little bit deeper uh, into the into their personal uh, lived experience, not that they have to share their whole life, but there are always elements of your personal lived experience that can help um, explain why you care about your professional objective, right? And I think it's combining all of that in a consistent way that, that really works for people. Um, so but, you know, more directly to your point of what would I say to people who are you know, worried or should they do it, should they not do it? Only you know the answer, right? And the only person's permission you need to do it is you. No one like me, no consultant should try to convince you to be uncomfortable, right? If you do not see value in it and it feels very weird to you, you're, I'm totally with you, right? Um, so it's really a thing of, okay, I, I see value in it. I have a level of ambition that this will help me you know, make good on. Um, and, and I think what we do encourage people to do is to, to try it in some way, whether it's in the written form or the video form. Uh, and a lot of our training is to try to, give peop to get people launched so they, they kind of feel that the whole, the, this whole process of having to have really perfect thoughts is demystified. Um, and, and what we like to tell people is that they are already full of thoughts, which are very valid right? um, and very interesting and unique. And they don't have to convince millions of people that these are the best thoughts ever. They have to convince a micro community of maybe 50 to 500 people that those are the best thoughts ever. And those people are already tuned into their LinkedIn network, for example, and care about what they have to say. So they're there for it. And in a sense, they're waiting for it, right? So it's a very, uh, especially with LinkedIn, a very welcoming environment for you to put yourself out there. Uh, and generally, unlike something like Twitter, you're not gonna get your head chopped off right away. Um, so you know, it's, it's a place where you should go experiment if it feels right, but if you hate it, then you should absolutely not do it. And there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And I think what's also maybe comforting for some people is that you don't uh, really need to reach a big uh, audience to be efficient. What is also specific for, for EU bubble comps that you don't, you're not uh, talking to hundreds of thousands uh, of fans or, or, or any type of big audience. You sometimes you want to reach uh, a dozen of people and uh, 
with that it 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 may be more uh of less less of a, less of a challenge but actually i wanted to um ask you about uh you know finding the balance between quality and quantity because when i look through uh some advice uh from experts who post about their experience on how to become big on linkedin how to build um a, a, a community on LinkedIn, the the one advice that stands out is you have to post a lot and it has to be regular. It has to be at least one post a day, five days a week. And if you do it seven days a week, even better. And for someone who, especially for someone who works with sophisticated issues where you can't just post simple you know to do list five tools to make your uh day uh product more productive but you 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 have to uh provide uh really you know thought out content um what how would you advise to balance uh quantity and quality and still stay um efficient with with uh with your presence on linkedin Sure. Well, first of all, you made a great point about the small community that you're trying to reach. And I think it's super important to always keep that in mind. If you're out on LinkedIn or on the internet trying to read up on how to be great at LinkedIn, you'll usually find advice that is geared towards getting you a very large audience. And the, the, the fact of the matter is you don't need to, to do that, right? Your, uh, your world, your professional world is typically very small, especially if you work in the EU bubble. But to be honest, it's the case for almost everyone everywhere. <laughs> Unless you are doing business to consumer B2C marketing, your, your audience is small. So we're, we're, uh, the whole world is, is overlapping micro communities and we're always, you know, talking to a niche, right? So if you, you know, a good place to start is to think that, that my whole audience is maybe maximum 500 people who are actually going to affect an outcome that I need professionally, whether that's an advocacy outcome or a business outcome that already reduces a lot of the, um, you know, the scariness, right? So when it comes to, you know, quality over quantity, uh, I would say what that, think about what that audience is looking for from you, right? They're looking for you to add value in somehow on a consistent basis. So whether that is seven days a week, five days a week, three days a week, Honestly, I don't think that it really matters, right? I think if you're really just getting started out, you probably need to do a bit more just to kind of um, make sure that people understand what you're about. So we often talk about three overlapping circles of influential people on, on, on LinkedIn, for example. Um, you have a niche focus, top circle. You have a, a, a personal point of view that is a little bit loaded with some lived experience or a little bit of personality. Uh, or the why of why you why you care about whatever you're talking about, per, per, you know, from a professional point of view, and then you have this differentiator circle, right? So what what kind of content or point of view are you putting out that looks different to other members of that micro community, right? So if you use that very simple strategic roadmap of what's my my niche focus, which is maybe one issue or one to three topics, my personal point of view, why I care, right? And therefore, why you as the audience should care and also the differentiator for what you're giving that others are not giving. Um, and you just look back at that and you, you answer those three questions, right? Um, every time, fill in those circles. And I think, you know, from a consistency point of view, if you have to put a number on it, I would say, you know, two to three times a week is, is, is a good place to start. Um, and I think, you know, we often get the question, well, what should it look like? What, what's great content? The great content is stuff that comes from here that you actually believe in because the people in your world will recognize that, right? So just act as if you were at, you know, at a, having coffee with those people. What would you talk about? You're probably already talking about those things. You know how to talk this talk, right? You don't have to go look on the internet for how to write a great LinkedIn post about what's in my, what's in my head already. And I can't tell you either. I mean, we do help people tease it out and, and get clarity on that. Um, but essentially you already know. So from a consistency, from a quality and quantity point of view, if you are consistently allowing the great thoughts in your head to, to pour onto the page, right? Between one and three times a week, and you do that for six months, you will see results. Absolutely. And you'll see results in terms of, you know, very anecdotally in terms of new connection requests, maybe speaking requests, 
um, you know, coffee date requests. Uh, you'll be invited to a, to a meeting that maybe you wouldn't have been invited to. So those are the real life metrics that you would see on something like on LinkedIn that have nothing to do with engagement rates, um, you know, video views, all these things, right? Social media platforms throw a lot of numbers at you because they're actually not built for advocacy professionals, they're built for marketers or B2B salespeople. So you have to take all of those and put them in their place and say, my actual metric for success here is did I get these, these five new people into my micro community who, or into my network you know, because they're very important to my micro community. And if I got over six months, I got five coffee dates with five people, then you're killing LinkedIn. You're awesome at it because that's all you need to do and all the numbers don't matter. So if you find your, the right consistency for you, could still be one, one time a week or one time a month. If you still got those five coffee dates, then that's fine, right? So start with the metric that you're after, which is a very real world metric and work backwards to, to how much you need to post. There's no hard and fast rule. And anybody telling you that you're failing because you're not there enough or your posts don't start with a great hook, it's just, it's just not true, right? You, you can develop your own personality on there and be your own self and it will still work. And then what I think people should also realize is that most of the time when you start posting on LinkedIn, you get reactions from from people you already know anyway, because uh, we're, we're, we're probably already connected to some of our uh, friends and colleagues from our uh, from our uh, industry from who, who, who will who will be interested in the topics we we speak about. So um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's not that hard. Uh, if I if I also get the point of what you're saying right, absolutely. Um, those people are they're already interested in what you have to say, and you just like we don't convince people to do LinkedIn at social trainings or something. You don't have to convince people that they should have to listen to you because they've already opted into your network. You probably already know them. Um, you don't even necessarily need to be to go into something like think LinkedIn thinking I need to meet all these new people because I'm meeting the usual suspects. That's fine. Like I said, the usual suspects are the ones who influence outcomes in your world, right? Um, so you may or may not have to, to meet new ones, right? You just need to more consistently um, interact with the ones who are there and they need to see you as having more added value than you had, than they, than they perceived before, right? So just convincing five people that you are a little bit more interesting or useful um, within that six month time span is also good enough. It, it is possible and this is very scary for people when, they, when they're building strategies for, for anything in Brussels, LinkedIn or otherwise, it is possible that your her whole audience is five people. It is possible that your whole audience is one person, right? Like a rapporteur on a file, right? These are real things, but somehow we still get swept up in this idea of volume and numbers when the name of the game is, is just niche, right? So very focused and very targeted and spending all that time just to, to get five people to, to think a little bit differently than they are currently or to think about you differently um, is a very valid use of your time and is much more business critical usually than all these big numbers and engagement rates. So if you, if you, if you give it a shot, um, you just put your, your real self out there, you do that consistently, you will see results. Uh, let me see if you will agree with me on this one. Um, some people who have their English speaking presence in Brussels, they have some national presence in their in their local language, uh, have this challenge of either posting different content in two languages. I've seen people posting the same post in two languages. Um, then uh, most people probably decide that they should focus on posting in just one language, which I think is uh, is the right strategy to do. Uh, since LinkedIn has translation uh, options uh, anyway. But then there's another uh, situation where uh, it might not be the uh, two or three different languages you want to address people in, but totally different target groups. For example, in my case, I obviously have a target audience uh, I want to talk to in the EU bubble, but I also have other um, other uh, activities. Uh, one is connected to esports and gaming. Um, and honestly, for now, um, I this because this podcast I'm doing um, and, and the EU bubble audience uh, 
is a priority for me, I decided not to post about anything else uh, because I, I believe this would sort of um, not help with the strategy, not help with uh, with also telling the algorithm who I'm talking to and why my content is um, is good for 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 this uh, for this audience. Uh, would you agree this is a good strategy? Would you would you do it differently? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a tough one. We have a similar um, conundrum here because we, while eighty-five percent of our of our business is in the EU bubble, fifteen uh, percent is in Belgium, um, where other languages are spoken, <laughs> uh, Dutch and French, um, more specifically, also German. Uh, and I think you know, you, you really do have to kind of make a choice. And I think uh, something like you know LinkedIn, it it. It, it needs focus. Like just in general, if you if you want to reach one market well, you can't be sending the wrong signal to that market that you're actually not part of that. So, and as as sad as that is, even in Europe where we we're multilingual, everyone speaks a few different things, and they've they've traveled around. If they see something that that feels foreign to them, unconsciously they they tune that out, right? So uh, algorithms aside, right? So even if people would fully see all of the other content, then they would be like, oh well, that is a that's from over there, right? Even you know, looking at us, we we have our HQ in Antwerp, but we spend most of our time in Brussels. We just like live in Antwerp, and we like it here. Um, sometimes even that is a turnoff. That might be a shock to you, Christophe. It's like even like thirty minutes away. The fact that if we're positioned as a Belgian agency in Antwerp, where the, everybody speaks Dutch, we're already a little bit too foreign for for so some for some taste in, in Brussels, right? So I think. You know, it's a very calculated thing, and I think you have to look at the majority of people in your micro community that you need to reach, um, and then devote to that. Um, that said, there are other ways to differentiate your other self <laughs> for other things, um, uh, but I think it, it really is tough to to have to be everything to everyone um, because just that's not how the, the human mind is, is 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 built, right? So. Whether we, we would all admit it to ourselves or, or not, we put people in boxes very quickly, right? Um, and in a world where there's limited attention already, we want to think, okay, Christoph, he's got this podcast. He does EU, uh, EU affairs and communications, um, and he's a really great looking guy. <laughs> so that's as much as we can think of. Um, but if we often have to think, oh, but he does these other things, you know, for us, those look like you know, distractions to the main thing. And we want Christoph to be completely focused on, on our main thing, right? Otherwise, he's not for us. So those are like the split second calculations people make. And whether it's, you know, you and I work in a business context, but if you're an advocacy professional and you, sh and you shift from, say, an energy issue uh, to a security and defense issue, and then you're, you're going back and forth, those two micro communities may be too far apart to see the correlation, right? You can see how those things make sense together, but independently, they may, they may not see that. And that leads them to not really understanding what, what to make of you, right? So they have to, if they have to associate you with one thing, because that's all they, their brain has time for, um, then they don't know what that is. And then you just, you kind of, you know, by default get cast aside. So it's a tough one, but I do think you have to make a choice. Absolutely. Uh, I recently had this chat with a friend um, who has been working for a number of very different in industries um, in the EU bubble. Um, and we were discussing how he could find some common narrative to to ha have a storytelling um, strategy about his career. Um, these were, and, and, and sometimes it's difficult, but in, in his case, it was actually uh, um, possible to find one common ground because all of these uh, associations and, and companies he worked for were some of the most regulated industries uh, that you can imagine. And we just figured that uh, the, the, the common ground, the, the, the angle here is that he's an expert in working for those difficult, very regulated industries, and somehow he can uh, turn that into his speciality. So uh, there, there is always a way, but I think that uh, one thing that we both agree on is that it has to be one specific, uh, like an elevator pitch. So what's your, you know, what's your LinkedIn about? It's mine is about this and yours is about this. And um, there might not be a way around that. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's tough to commit to a story because you don't want to shut down opportunities outside of that. And of course, a, a real human being is much more layered than, than that, right? So it, 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 it does feel a bit weird sometimes to say, well, I'm only going to be that there. Um, and, you know, that's one of the downsides, I think, is that you can't be your full self um, unless you really have thought about how you package that into a bit of a story. Um, but even then, you know, I think it's just understanding what, what, what things like social media are good for and what they're not. You can go be the rest of yourself in person, right? Um, where you have more time with people. And when people would meet us, like they may know us for, for one of three things. They'll know us for, for LinkedIn and thought leadership. They'll know us for video. Um, they'll know us for more strategy, uh, exercises that we do with, with, with big groups of people in our idea sprint, or they'll know us sort of those four things or, or, or experiences, right? So it's, they, sometimes those things, they overlap, sometimes they don't. So actually I find that people in my network will, will know me for one of those four things exclusively. And I'll wonder how did this happen, right? So we'll either be LinkedIn guy, experience guy, um, strategy guy, whatever. Um, so I think naturally people seeing you what they want to see, but you do have to give them enough of the story so that they don't have to do too much mental uh, gymnastics to piece it all together, right? So I think there's room for versatility and depth, um, but the story can't be so complicated that it's too hard for them to understand. So this is something that maybe not everyone would notice, uh, but with my agency and consultancy background, I noticed it right away. And I really appreciate how clear you are on in your communications and on your website, uh, as Bump, um, with telling clients what you are looking for in a client to um, actually make the relationship work out well for both sides. Uh, it's... Uh, it's a rare, rare thing uh, still, um, although more and more um, agencies try to try to actually position themselves uh, in, in, in a way that they attract the right clients. But I think it's still it's still very much undervalued how much how 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 good it actually is for the business uh, of an agency. Um, so what are your principles at Bump for for a good uh, Client, agency client relationships that benefits both parts. Sure. So, I mean, I think the, the reason why we got to this point, because there's a whole lot of thinking that went into communicating about that is that we realized to do the great work that we're proud of, right? We need a certain, we need to operate within a certain construct. And that was not the de, de facto construct of an agency client relationship, right? The de facto construct was one of, um, you know, client and order taker, right? So the client said, here's all this money um, after a whole pitch process. Now, you know, make it all happen. You promise me the world in the pitch. The power dynamic is such that I own you. <laughs> and that's that, right? And I think that is something that we just, we just didn't like, you know, it's not just because, oh, it, it's uncomfortable and, you know, it's, it's a difficult part of doing business. It literally was affecting the outcomes of our work because we could not uh, do great creative work or great strategic work if we, we weren't here. I, I was, I'm going to naturally do this with my hands. <laughs> we need to be here, not you here and me here, but we need to be here. That is the only way we can do the kind of work that you hired us to do, right? So we found that we needed to be very clear, to be very clear about like a very intentional effort to communicate um, what kind of agency we are. We're a creative consultancy and an agency. Um, that we, you know, we, we thrive uh, and clients thrive with us when there are, I guess we call it three P's and a, two P's and a T, um, uh, partnership, positivity, and trust. The partnership thing is that we're right here, right? We're in it together. We're equally accountable for success, which is huge, right? It's not that you pay us money and we, we, we make everything happen. We make a lot happen, but we can only make it happen with you, right? Um, the, the, the trust thing is that you trust us to be honest with you uh, about pricing, about what's feasible, about the outcomes. And that's only because we've decided to be partners, right? And the positivity thing is that like, why are we being mean to each other? Like, how are we going to make great work if you were angry? Right? So we have to kind of check that negativity at the door. Um, cause we're not going to do 
stuff that we're going to get negative good stuff if we're more preoccupied with being angry and establishing a power dynamic. So we, we just noticed that all these things were wrong in a typical agency client relationship. Um, but it's, it's not a client, our you know, prospective client's fault for not knowing that it could be another way. So in order for them to know how it could be, we do have to communicate about it every day, right? We make videos about it. We, when we start a new conversation um, with a prospective client, we say, this is the, the way w that we work. It is not for everyone, right? But it, it's the only way that we can work because it's the only way that will lead to this outcome. And we will stand behind every outcome we can do, uh, we, we provide, if we can do it in this way. Otherwise, we think it's not gonna be very good. And, and also that negativity or the lack of trust or lack of partnership, that you may think that that is, that is you know, only in our relationship, but that kind of mental uh, fatigue, that will be an, you know, create knock-on effects for every other client and every other member of the team, right? So then that is not the kind of agency that we're trying to run where people are exhausted, they're burned out, um, they feel like all their creative uh, energy is, is wasted. Like that is, you know, to, to put it very bluntly, we don't want to spend our lives that way. And God damn it, we don't have to, right? So, uh, so we, we, we establish an agency that, you know, works in a different way, um, you know, communicates that clearly. And what we can do when we talk to a new prospective client is we can identify a match or a mismatch. We will not convince, we will not pitch. Um, we put enough of ourselves out there in video, in coffees, at events, where you can get to know us and, and figure out if we're for you or not, right? And it's right there very clearly and transparently stated. Um, and that means that, yeah, 95% of the client base is, does not choose us, but we very intentionally have built an agency that can still thrive if only 5% chooses us, right? So we, everything has gone into curating this whole vibe so that it works in service of creativity, in service of relationships, and it remains a viable business. So I remember when I first started uh, in the agency business it was years ago, uh, I was looking for mentors. And uh, one of the guys I, I actually was very uh, lucky to, to uh, meet was uh, David Williams, who uh, was the guy who started uh, Sachi and Sachi in Poland. Um, back in the 90s um, and he was a gold mine of, 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 of insights and, and, and knowledge. But one thing that um, I remember until today, one advice that he gave me is to never pitch creative work uh, without being paid for, uh, to use your past work, to use your, your um, portfolio to, to show what your, what, what your value is, but never work for free uh, because that from the start builds uh, a, a better relationship between between you and the client, and 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 makes you work for the long, for the wrong clients who don't value the 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 work you provide. But then, as I started working with more and more clients, and 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 was looking for more business, I found that this is actually one of the most difficult things to uh, to not do this because it's so tempting to just, you know, show a little bit of uh, examples of what you would do for the specific clients, just, you know, to maybe show them a couple of mock-ups because, you know, uh, why not? Mm. And now looking at the, at the EU bubble, I, I think you can say that there are a couple of um, typical ways how the cooperation between an agency and a client starts. One is at official tender. Uh, another one is you, you recommend it and, and, and you, you, you submit some proposals. Um, I don't see a lot of briefing processes where, where there is a very specific professional brief coming out of, of the clients. Um, maybe maybe uh, this um, is something that uh, the industry could work on 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 somehow professionalizing the uh, the process. How would you, if if you could, um, give everyone who's looking for an agency, who's looking for 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 a consultancy in communications or creative or 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 media uh, production, um, what in your uh, per, from your perspective would be the ideal process? How to start the relationship so it arrives at where you want it to be. Yeah, so um, I think 
you know, as a client, you should not start with a brief. You should start with a problem that you need solving. So we, we get brought in when there's a problem, not when there's a brief written. So uh, having a brief presupposes that you as the client know exactly what to do about the problem. Um, you may already know that, you may not, but you know, that for us is the first signal that you're looking for a, a, a sparring partner on what, what we do about this, right? And, we, and usually in a Brussels context, it's not just your problem, it's a bunch of other people's problem that you work with. And if you're a trade association, they don't always work within your company, they might have different agendas. So you already have a, a kind of a messy situation and supposedly you all agree on how to solve this problem, but the truth is you don't actually agree, right? So the, the process of just knowing what to do is already a big piece of work right there, right? So it's stakeholder management, which is the name of the Brussels game. And you have to do it internally before you can do it externally. So what I realized a long time ago is that that internal bit was almost way more important than the external bit because it could just, it could be killed so quickly along that process. Um, and that's why I, I, I feel that it's, it's generally a waste of time for me to, or for, for Bump to prescribe an answer to a brief that is not fully, where the problem is not fully teased out, right? Or where people stand is not fully teased out. So with our idea sprint process, we go through a lot of stakeholder consultation. Um, it's all on our website. If you want to steal the process, everyone's allowed to open source, but that allows you to figure out what you should do. So uh, to, you know, more, more pointed adv advice to someone who's looking for an agency, um, I would say meet agency people before you need one, right? It's a small town in Brussels um, and people are open for coffees. Uh, pay attention to who's out there and go have a coffee with them, right? Just like you would have any old relationship, you know, uh, human relationships are formed in generally the same way. You meet each other, there's a click. <laughs> um, and generally you, you, you wanna do that before there's a pressing need. Um, I think the, the worst way to form a relationship is to write down a piece of paper, send it to 10 agencies and then ask them to spend three weeks on a 100 page slide deck and then do a, a silly little dance for you, which you call a pitch, right? And then on the basis of that, you'll somehow know that they're up for the job, right? Um, I've pitched many times in my career, <laughs> right? Sometimes I won, more often I lost. And, and in almost every case, I felt that my creative energy was absolutely wasted, right? And I just decided I will not spend another moment of my life giving you my finite creative energy for free, right? Um, it's, just, it's just bad living. <laughs> bad business is one thing, but to live a life where you give away stuff that you really care about and really feel strongly about, you put yourself into every pitch as, a, as someone who really cares about craft or being creative or just answering, you know, fixing that problem. You're gonna like, there's no, there's no halfway with a good consultant. Like a good consultant is gonna put it all on the line every time. And to do that consistently for no money, and in fact, not just no money, but actual abuse coming from those you're pitching to, it's, ups it's absurd. It's like, you know, ask Einstein about what the definition of insanity is or whatever, right? So, and then to do that over and over, right? So I, I do not want to be known as the anti-pitch guy, right? Uh, I'm not the anti-pitch guy. I'm the pro good idea guy, right? And you only get good ideas if you set the, the construct right so that we're, you know, Two peas in a tea, baby. Not that hard, right? Partnership, positivity, and trust. And everything that is not feeding that dynamic is not helpful and it will not lead to a good idea. So if you're looking for an agency, go out and meet people who you wanna go spend time with, who you want to partner with, um, who, you, you, who you agree you want to show up and be positive around and you, you thrive on each other's positivity and creativity and people who you wanna give your trust to. Um, on a human level, right? And then you'll find the agency that you want. The idea that you just find that through a pitch process is just, uh, you know, uh, it's very illogical to think that. And everybody who is sending out briefs for pitches knows that, but they still do it. So I think from the, from the client side, you have to be ready to take the next step in your professional development actually, to say, I'm senior enough to know what I want. I'm senior enough to know the kind of people that I will work well with. I'm gonna go find those people uh, and then I'm gonna you know, try something small with them if I have to, to convince everybody else, but I'm gonna take a leap, uh, you know, leap on this and, and do something that I really feel strongly about with people who, who make sense to me. And that basically is our client base, or those people who are senior enough to, to call those shots and to say, all of that I don't want, this is what I do want. Um, and then you, you kind of know 
you know, that's, that's the way that you need to, to proceed is with people that you actually trust and want to work with. And I love the, I, I, I love what you said about um, actually um, meeting uh, the agency people before you uh, before you need them because even if your organizational uh, procedures require you to go through the tendering process, uh, you can do so much before you actually start it uh, to meet the people you want to uh, work with, and there there is always a better way to do it. There's always a way to to um, think more about the process before you actually launch it, right? Of course. I mean, you know, if you are a true experienced professional who cares about their craft and, you know, you want to make something actually happen, you know that whatever institutional processes you have to deal with are obstacles for you. And you are already of the mind to navigate these obstacles in service of doing the great thing, which you know, right? So I, I think you have to, to, to look for ways around that. And I'm not saying skirt procurement processes or whatever, which we don't compete in because, again, they're a waste of time. And we always have the client who's like, yeah, it's you. But then the procurement people, and if, the, if you can't make that connection happen, we can't help it, right? So, so that's one thing that we, we don't get involved with. But just to say that... Um, you know, uh, uh, like an experienced professional is going to build a network that will help them do what they need to do, right? Uh, and no process or, you know, pitch document or, or, or you know, presentation is going to change that, you know, that construct for them, right? So they've got to go out and build relationships with the right people, seek out those people. Um, there are lots of people on LinkedIn who make themselves visible like we do. The people who are, who are already visible you know, start there, right? But then, like if I meet someone new who's met me on LinkedIn, then I usually introduce them to five other people who I think are really good, right? Because we're not always the right agency. So just networking in Brussels is, is easy, right? Um, it's not like a big town like London and New York where people are like, what, what's your agenda? What do you want, right? Here, it's just like, yeah, it's just coffee, right? It's your office day this week, so we can do a coffee. Um, so I think, yeah. you know, just go out and be exposed to people and you'll you'll, it takes you on a path. It's almost like this little rabbit hole um, where one coffee leads to, to, you know, a hundred more. And by the end of it, you have a really uh, comprehensive take on all the talent that's available, um, all the things, the stuff that has been gone, has done, been done before in service of whatever objective that you had. And you end up being not just a better network person, but a more, uh, a more, you know, well-rounded advocacy or public affairs or comms professional because you expose yourself to other people's perspectives, Right. That's how I would suggest you do it. Meet people. So I'd like to finish with um, a question that will be um, hopefully uh, interesting uh, advice for uh, the younger audience. Um, from analyzing the past episodes, I actually already know that we have an audience uh, in, in not a big one, but there is an audience in their early 20s uh, watching uh, this, this show. Um, and I think it's important to tell to 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 tell people who are looking to launch their careers um, what might work, what might not work. Um, where would you start uh, if you would be um, starting a career in the EU bubble today? How would you sure. how would you approach your career launch? So the 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 number one piece of advice I can give to anybody who wants to do a job that they to kind of fast track their career when you're starting from almost zero is to just start having thoughts, right? And then start publishing them somewhere. That can be LinkedIn. That could be, you know, that you put up a portfolio site with just perspective campaigns that you, I'm talking to comms people. That's really where I can speak to the most. That, that you know, maybe you gave yourself a fake uh, problem to solve and you came up with the campaign. Just to show that you've done something. You've paid attention, you've listened to what other people are doing. And that you you already dove into a, an exercise of that of that kind. Um, when I, when I was ever trying to look for interns at my at my last job, it would always be like, hey, where's the portfolio? If I only had a CV, then I you know they all look the same. But if I could see that someone had tried something, and I didn't care if it was perfect or correct or if I would do it the same way, that's not the point. The point is that they tried, right? So whatever brilliance that you have in your head, make sure that someone sees it, um, and you have all these tools available to do that. Once you've got your first thing, whatever that is, 
then I think you have to be a little bit, you know, ruthless with, with yourself and not let yourself fall into a complacency trap. Because I think there are a lot of places where you can go and hang out for many years. And then someone will tell you, you're the junior, you're the junior, wait your turn, wait your turn. Don't wait your turn, right? Um, look around, uh, move quickly if you want to. Um, make sure that you are excited to go to work every day and that someone is challenging you with something. Do not ever let anyone tell you that you should be happy with what you have. Um, you should wait your turn. All these type of things about that put you kind of in your place um, are red flags. Leave immediately, right? I did that every time. Every time I was at a job and it didn't feel right, I'm like, see ya, I'm out, right? So be mobile in that sense. Don't worry about these perceptions of job hopping. Oh, well, you didn't stay a year. Don't care. It's your life. If you don't like it, get out. Even one month at a place you don't like, waste. Waste of your life, right? So just do what feels right for you. Be confident in what you're doing and your ability. Um, don't be so arrogant that you can't listen. So know what you know and know what you don't know. But especially in the early years, just lean towards the side of what you do know and then just go nuts with that, right? And be that person who can do that thing very well. And just by doing it over and over and communicating that you're doing it very well and being proud of it will we'll create opportunities for you. So um, very American things to say, I know, but I've been here for 20 years, so I'm the good kind of American. But like that kind of make it happen for yourself thing, I really believe in, even after spending most of my, uh, my life at this point I've spent in Europe, I still believe and will teach my Belgian kids that they've got to make it happen for themselves and not wait for other people to make it happen for them. I think this is great advice. And um, you said that you, you can give advice to comms people because that's what you do. Um, I, would, I would strongly disagree with that. This is great <laughs> advice for, for anyone. If you want to be, uh, become a political advisor in an MAP's office or a research officer in a think tank or, you know, it, I could go on. This, this, most jobs in the EU bubble have something to do with communicating. Um, either on the one-on-one -on -one basis with, with stakeholders or attending events uh, and networking. Networking is also about communicating. Yep. Um, and, and now what we discussed uh, mostly during this podcast, uh, the, the, the building of a personal brand. Uh, that is mm, something that should be practiced by anyone who wants to... Who wants to Uh, boost their career, become more visible, uh, just just you know build their personal brand, uh, and and it's far more than just people in comps who should uh, who should follow your advice. I would say. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's for everybody. Absolutely, uh, Brett. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, thank you everyone who listened to to um, our chat. Uh, the next episode. Uh, We'll be back next week, uh, as usual. So thanks a lot, everyone. And thank you, Brett, for your time and so much valuable advice. Thanks, man. Appreciate the invite.